I guess jumping ahead, ultimately we'll be talking to about 30 people. Everything has been recorded, uh, um, both sound and visual. That would be available in uh, the Rutgers sort of historical archive. And then we'd like to bring together uh, some of the highlights of these discussions in some visual um, and maybe a small publication that would then be made available at J&J um, &J or the New Brunswick Public Library, etc. So, so, so uh, and uh, who are some of the people that you've talked to that sure. I might know back? John Heldrich. Yes. He yes. was the J&J &J right. person, vice president, right. whom Dick Sellers put in charge of New Brunswick tomorrow. the New Brunswick tomorrow. Um, three different mayors, um, Pat Sheehan, John Lynch, and the current mayor, James Cahill. Yeah. We've spoken with Eric Krebs, who was the developer of the cultural, arts, the cultural theater. theater. He direct, he founded some theaters in New Brunswick mm -hmm. and helped her to revitalize the, what became the cultural center area. Um, a few Rutgers people, Kenneth Wheeler, who was, who Ed Blaustein, who was then the president, designated as the Rutgers liaison to New Brunswick. Um, Bob Campbell, who was another vice president at J&J, &J, who was also involved in the hospital boards. People um, involved with um, um, New Brunswick Tomorrow and the New Brunswick yes. Development Corporation. Previous uh, directors of DEFCO, mm -hmm. city administrators, Tony Marchetta, whom we just talked to yesterday, was a si assistant city administrator when the project was being developed. I think the... Uh Leo the only Milliner. person I clearly recognize or recall is John, John Haldridge. We tried okay. speaking with Leo Molinero. He was with American Cities Corporation, mm -hmm. who developed the first feasibility study for J and J. But I get his wife has been ill, and we haven't been able to see him. But and Dick Sellers apparently is not well, so we haven't been able to speak with him. And, and there yeah. are again roughly about ten more people that they mm -hmm. trying to. Um, also, we spoke. Well, you to talk to. No, I, he also is not available. I, I think he has Alzheimer's and oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> not able to speak. With him. He was such a bright man. Yes, right. Right. Dick Sellers and Jim Burke were two people we would have liked speaking with, but they're not well. Okay. Well, so. If I'm rambling too much, just stop. No, 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 no. But our uh, involvement with uh, New Brunswick began with our engagement by J and J to do a master plan for their new headquarters. Mm -hmm. At that time, Dick Sellers was the chairman, uh, and Dick Sellers was also the mainspring behind New Brunswick Tomorrow. simultaneously with doing the work for J&J, &J, we were asked to do a sort of framework plan for downtown New Brunswick for New Brunswick tomorrow. And of course, uh, we clearly recognized that these were two different clients, but at the same time, the sponsorship of J&J &J was sort of essential to New Brunswick tomorrow, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've been in other situations where we've done corporate headquarters and the corporate client has wanted to place, which I think is a very responsible thing to do, to place their headquarters in the context of a larger plan. Um, I think it is a responsible thing to do. It almost always exposes us and the corporate client to 
suspicion of manipulation. And you know the, it's all being strings are being pulled from <laughs> the corporate center, so to speak. Uh, even though it's a separate enterprise, uh, we we regarded it as a completely separate enterprise. Uh, we didn't have any contact with Johnson and Johnson with regard to the work for New Brunswick tomorrow. But of course, Eldridge was the chairman of. people we dealt with and people we were reporting to were community people, not Johnson & Johnson people. Um, so there were two parallel efforts. Um, obviously they were interactive in a certain sense. Uh, the, uh, work for New Brunswick Tomorrow was in two phases. All of this, I'm telling you not from direct recollection, but because I've looked through the files. <laughs> uh, we did the first study in the first half of 76, and the second study was done in the first half of 77. That study led to our design for something called Commercial Plaza, which I guess still exists. It's the first building of Commercial Plaza. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether other buildings were subsequently. Built. I don't know what happened to, the, to George Street in the intervening quarter century, but of course, George Street was intended to be the centerpiece of, of the regeneration of downtown New Brunswick. As such, uh, we hope to recover a strong retail activity together with commercial, uh, cultural, and so on. I don't know whether there were cultural projects being talked about. I don't know whether any have subsequently happened. Actually, if you'd like, I could give you like a 30 second. Uh, okay. So Commercial Plaza was the first, and then there was another office building and built next to it, and then for a while that was a bit of an island with sort of the old you know, George Street not doing very well as a retail corridor. But over time that, you know, that changed. You know, the the uh, um, George Street strengthened, you know, it was retail, and uh, in time they brought in some uh, um, you know, national retailers, um, Radio Shack, uh, etc. They they beautify the area. With, uh, gas lamps, and, um, um, planters, uh, etc. And then, two blocks from Commercial Plaza, in fact, developed a very, very, very strong uh, cultural uh, concentration of three theaters: the old movie theater, the the Slopes East. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the State Theater, which had been the Vaudeville era, a movie theater, um, was has now a performing arts center. And then there was a George Street Playhouse, again, a, a regional, that was in the YMCA, which was adaptively reused for uh, a theater. There was yet another theater there, and that, and that, and that became very, very, very key. So uh, Commercial Plaza, in fact, was became an anchor there, and especially as it got linked to the um, uh, performing arts, which then drew in high-end restaurants, etc. So I, I just wanted to... Right. You know, so it did, it did. So with Rutgers at one end and the performing arts at the other, there is a certain energy in George. Yes. And, and the retail did come back to some extent, not much. Somewhat. We have many more good restaurants than we yeah. have any decent retail. What about the housing? Well, that whole area was completely redeveloped. It was. In, and in there yeah. are townhouses, condos, and apartments, and that's actually done quite well. And it took a while. Even but. though it took it took 20 years of um, really the non-residential development and some of the cultural development mm -hmm. before, and of course the rural change. 
You know, now, you know, downtown housing and mixed use is people are very comfortable with that and seek that, in fact. So that, so in some of the old urban renewal cleared land, you're now getting uh, market priced housing. Uh, interestingly, they initially tried housing for ownership, thinking that we would have a more stable uh, group. But that was too soon. Then they started building rental, and rental rent rented up quite quickly because people were just making a year commitment. And but, so now there is a a quite strong housing market. Of course, we're in a challenged real estate climate. But right. but, but but there was um, the other in, thing that happened. In addition, Rutgers built buildings downtown. So beyond the State Theater is our building, in fact, the School of Planning well, and Public Policy. So Rutgers built buildings at the other end of George Street as well? Well, um, it's around the corner. The, at the end of George Street where the State Theater is and the Commercial Plaza, between those is now a large conference center hotel. Where there used to be the Roger Williams Hotel, they took that down the whole block, is now a large conference center hotel. And then across the street from them, up Livingston, where we are, we're a block up from George Street, where School of Planning and Public Policy and the Mason Grove School of the Arts from Rutgers share a building. And Rutgers also built a large residence hall right across the street, New Street, from Commercial Plaza. So. Oh. A lot more has happened. Well, yeah. Well, let me just go back to mm -hmm. what we thought we were doing, what we actually did. <laughs> uh, um, we, I, I don't know what, how much you know about our practice, but in the 60s we were quite active in around the country um, because in the 50s we had actually been, our firm began as the architectural division of the real estate company, but now William Zekadov Senior's real estate company. And he was one of the first people uh, to recognize the potential of the renewal and, uh, and got us involved in Society Hill in Philadelphia, which you may know. And as a result of that experience, when we uh, separated from one of them and became I Bank Partners, uh, a separate firm, because we were one of the few architects who had experience in urban renewal, albeit for a developer, we were engaged by a number of cities to do urban renewal. Boston, my hometown, was one. Did the government send the plan? Um, Cleveland, Erie, and Oklahoma City, Los Angeles, Bunker Hill. We did a number of urban uh, plans. And uh, by the end of the 60s, um, we were very much aware of the say more of the shortcomings of urban renewal than of its accomplishments, the way one often is. We were very much aware, for example, of the sort of fatal flaw in the urban renewal planning process, which tended to over-prescribe renewal uh, through the medium of illustrative site plans. In effect, the phrase I like to do is stretch one mind across many acres, which is a fatal thing to do in cities. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning that is by the time we became engaged in New Brunswick, we were very much aware of that problem and very anxious to avoid that problem. In other words, we we saw ourselves as planners uh, helping to develop a, strate a strategy for renewal, but 
eager to avoid prescribing too much. Uh, and uh, our work for New Brunswick tomorrow was very much strategic. Uh, that's probably why there is a great deal of record of it, because it was, I mean, these transparencies which we used in presentations to the community are essentially all I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and if you look at them, you'll see that they're all focused on some strategy. The, the, the framework plan. Uh, and uh, so at the same time, of course, we were doing an architectural design for a major campus for Johnson & Johnson, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum of our practice, which did embrace uh, a wide range of building types already at that time, uh, but also had this planning component. Uh, we were very active in planning uh, in the 60s, pretty much up until 1980. Uh, we have, in recent times, been angry active in, in planning. And one of the reasons, of course, is that uh, the whole, shall I say, the planning profession and the whole idea about what planning is has, has been in disarray <laughs> for a long time. Uh, maybe a healthy disarray <laughs> with, of course, a much greater emphasis on local community input and this kind of thing. And that was already, I mean, there was already, because after all, this was the mid-70s, after the Cultural Revolution in the late 60s. And so, as I mentioned, when I go back through the file, I can already find evidence in letters of people who were suspicious of us and Johnson and Johnson mm -hmm. and thinking that we were simply We took great care, however, to separate the two. So, um, I think that there's no doubt. I mean, Johnson Johnson was trying to be a good citizen. Mm -hmm. um, the decision to stay in New Brunswick and expand in New Brunswick was took it. It was a very subject of a lot of debate within Johnson & Johnson. They almost went to the suburbs. Uh, and, and going against the current yeah, at that, that mm -hmm. time. So, but of course, the decision to stay in Brunswick and to specifically to acquire that site um, uh, on the, uh, between Albany and the railroad tracks already raised issues that at that time were just in their inception, but now would have been taken much more seriously. Um, I mean, the, that zone was a very rundown area mm -hmm. and certainly fit into the definition of, uh, right. of, of a candidate for slum clearance, so called. Right. But it also was the oldest area and had in it, uh, I still have in my files a letter from Elizabeth Moynihan begging Johnson Johnson to preserve a, a tunnel used by a brewery. I don't know the name of it. It was on that site, an old tavern, and there was some kind of a historic tunnel map today. Huh. Uh, I think. It was right in the middle of the change of property, so it, was, it, it proved to be impossible. Mm. But today, I think it might have been a deal breaker, that kind of thing, because mm. so much more attention is being paid to uh, not just visible, but invisible historic artifacts. Mm -hmm. so, um, anyway, we were embarked on this kind of dual assignment, and. Uh, 
as it happened, uh, I was the sort of designated partner in charge of both of the change I had was in. But the staff involvement was quite different, quite separate. But I was the principal responsible for both efforts. Um, and uh, um, now just a little bit. I don't know whether you know this stuff, but I've uh, heard of it. I have not seen I it. I urge you to. Uh, I discovered this somehow. I discovered the original, and I made a copy. I don't know what I'm sure so the original it's exists in the, in the Brunswick. Lot, maybe the New Brunswick Library. I'm sure it exists. Anyway, the reason uh, I was totally enchanted with this in because you have to remember we were coming out of the '60s, out of the era of renewal, and suddenly I came across this plan made by a man named Herbert Swan, who was quite a well-known planner in the 20s and 30s. And, and his approach to planning was exactly what we had in mind. <laughs> Very uh -huh. sensitive to, not at all sort of tabula rasa, wipe everything clean, but very much about going in and making uh, very limited Sur surgical, surgical kind of, and, and, and very much very civically oriented, very much about the quality of urban space, streetscape, and this kind of thing. So the reason I copied this, and I haven't read it for a good many years, but is that I thought of it as kind of a wonderful model, which I had not existed for how to deal with a city like this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I saw, also saw it as an emblem of uh, something. Maybe a lesson that uh, my generation failed to learn in our enthusiasm for weapons so clean. <laughs> uh, so this actually influenced our thinking. scope of our study, I found one document which I could copy for you. It's, a, it's evidently a report that I made quite early in our study. I don't have any of the illustrations that accompany it, but oddly enough, it's a fairly good outline of what we were thinking about New Brunswick. of our study to report, the purpose of this report, which I don't think was made in a talk of some kind, kind of remember, was to report on our appraisal of downtown and to define the broad outlines of a strategy for future development. So then part one was the appraisal, which was the assets, compactness of the downtown, proximity of residential areas proximity of major education, educational institutions, presence of J&J, &J, presence of county offices, topography, river and canal, slope from George Street to the river. Very positive in our view. Attractive 19th century buildings and sites, sense of history. And finally, George Street, tradition of retail, attractive scale, elevated position. Then liabilities. Now all of this was very early in the study, but um, liabilities, image of decline, especially in the retail area. Derelict state of east side, Iron Street to drive. Mm -hmm. Proximity of ugly crime ridden public housing. Too many vacant buildings and vacant sites, fragmentation, traffic congestion, inadequate access, circulation, and parking. Any development strategy for the future must be based on a concept for circulation and parking, which will eliminate existing inadequacies. We therefore begin with a discussion of this problem. At that time, we were working with a, a wonderful 
contract consultant, actually the best I've ever had the privilege of working with. Unfortunately, he died in the Jersey Warren Travers. He mm -hmm. was based in Clifton, New Jersey. Worked with us for many years. Uh, terrific traffic consultant. He, he then gave his report. Then I came back and described a development strategy as it was emerging. Based on, on the circulation concept, we can now define the desirable character of major streets in the downtown. A, George Street. Retain existing scale, improve conditions for pedestrians, reduce through traffic, strengthen the retail spine. Albany Street, widen landscape to create a boulevard image. And as you can see, that was important to us because it was within our power to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to our treatment of Walton Street and between George and, and the river, which mm -hmm. I regard as one of the better pieces of river design that we've done. Um, I hope it's still in good condition. It is. Uh, Livingston, retain and strengthen the boulevard image. And the rib streets, church, Patterson, Byron, mm -hmm. retain existing scale, strengthen activities at street level. Hiram Street, local access traffic only, build image based on church buildings and churchyard. George Street is and must remain central to any downtown development plan. Should be strengthened by four basic strategy, strategic concepts. One, infill development along George Street and along the rib block. Two, major multi-purpose development on power sites at north and south ends of George Street. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's how you're anchored. Three, downtown residential development on East Flank, Iron Street District. Four, civic center development on West Flank, uh, north to the road. Yeah, the, the courthouses, those were all, that whole area was re, re And five, uh, intercept, intercept parking directly accessible from perimeter circulation routes. I don't know where that's happening. Parking decks have been built. You know, not, not really into, into some kind of park. Yeah. Anyway, that's sort of interesting because mm. it's a very smart growth plan. Yeah. It's an autograph document. That's great. It describes exactly what we were thinking on the 11th of March, 1976. Yeah. <laughs> if you want it. Yeah, we, we, definitely. We, we would love to get copies of all of this. Uh -huh. um, now, in June of 76, we, we presented this report. And it's interesting that this report contains no illustrations. And that is kind of a reflection of our uh, our rejection of what we regarded as over-prescriptive, illustrative. Mm -hmm. So we did it all in words. I don't know whether you have this, but I can see it. No, no, actually, this, these are all yeah. important documents. So that right. does include uh, travel that's a, that's a fairly comprehensive document. I would say of all the things New Brunswick has done, they've done the least amount on traffic, unfortunately. Well, Route 18, improvement was that the subject was of a lot of debate. And that was completed, and in fact, they just completed more of it now. For about 30 years, they had plans to complete it through New Brunswick, widen it, and, and they've actually done a good job of that. It's almost finished. But the, the transit access is, is much, has become a real key right. attraction. The what? The transit the access. Transit. You know, that, uh, and how is that? With, well, and they're now talking about transit-oriented developments. You know, 
um, and in fact, the um, non-residential sector in terms of office development in part came about because people recognized being within five minutes of, of a main station on the main line on the East Coast, mm -hmm. train station, yeah. was a very attractive place to be. Yeah. But of course, that took, yeah. that's more within the last 10 years that, yeah. that that's, that's better appreciated. Some people commute to both Philadelphia and New York from uh, Yes. Yes, you know, it's well located that way. Yeah. This is interesting, College Avenue. Finally, there was a there was um, work done on closing down College Avenue to make it become a pedestrian mall. It's not complete yet, but um, some changes are being made now to make it become a much more pedestrian or maybe transit only, less rapid transit area. So, thirty years later, some of those things are finally happening. Now, uh, I don't know whether you have these documents, but I could also give you the contractual documents uh -huh. related to both phases of our work. Sure. Um, now that I've seen before the new friends work tomorrow. Well, this Matt, do you have that, David? So no, I, I, I think we should get copies of, okay. of, of all of this. They must, they must exist. Uh, they, may. They, may, they may. They may. They may. So I would say if, if we could just pay for this to be copied, that would be uh, in, right. including the, that old the 1920s plan. Oh, really? But this, no, you, you should get the original. It must exist. It must. Because this, it won't copy well, you see. Uh, this was not copied well to begin with. I, I would if we could just pay for just <laughs> copying the file. Okay. That, that would be... Uh, oh, here it says personal property, Kathleen Turner. Kathleen. Oakmont, 17 Oakmont Avenue, East Brunswick, New Jersey. Huh. I must have given it back to her. <laughs> in, 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 including your, your presentation notes. That, that would right. be, uh, yeah, well, that, that's sort of because that's... Right. That, that's we're not, we're not going to get any more else. Yeah. Right. Uh, then, I mean, I can't tell you what, but in these days before, we, we didn't like slides because mm -hmm. you couldn't tell a story with slides. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have PowerPoint, mm -hmm. which of course is terrific telling mm -hmm. a story. So what we did, we tended to to do this sort of thing. We would start with mm -hmm. with an image of the downtown. And then we might put this over it. Mm -hmm. And then we'd probably take this away and start with the old with the overlay switch. That was that was J and J's existing headquarters. And I can't tell you so then sorry I'm doing this for me. Uh, yeah we always oriented this uh -huh. emphasize. So that was see this is related to uh -huh. this infield retail. And our back. building is right at this corner, the school, and this is where the Heldrich is. That's a, that's a, a large, a large multi-use building. It's a hotel, it's a conference center, and, and, restaurants, and, and, and retail. Right. 
and it was named after John Helbridge. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Right. How old is John Helbridge now? John is in his later 80s, mid 80s, I guess, 85, 86. No, I don't and know. still very sharp, and we yeah. had a nice interview with him to it's begin really a shame with. about Jim Burke. Jim Burke yeah. was one of the best clients we ever had. He was so sharp. Yeah. And uh, it was it's tragic to think that he is also. Yeah. And he he was a very you know, just to so talking out of school. Uh, Dick Sellers, they were very different people. Right. And and our work for Johnson and Johnson began under Dick Sellers and continued under. Mm -hmm. Jim Burke and, and Dick Sellers sort of thought of J&J headquarters in monumental terms. I mean, he wanted a specimen. Originally, that's what he wanted was a mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, We sort of talked him out of that because we. Well, there are a whole lot of practical reasons, but also we wanted to engage this property at a scale that seemed sympathetic to that mm -hmm. type of project. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we didn't want it. I mean, our, the phrase that I use is, it's a building in a park, in a park in the city, so we wanted people to feel that they were passing by a park, not just a corporate I think that Marami has really grown up amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but when Jim Burke came in, his view about an appropriate posture for J and J in New Brunswick was the exact opposite. He actually would have preferred to have no tower. I mean, we have a very slight tower. Mm -hmm. so he he said to me several times that if he had to do over, he would have had no doubt, but it was, you know, was sort of amazing. But he was very just, sympathetic. Just, just more low-rise yeah. structure. Yeah. Um, I think the tower actually works as a kind of, without being too dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of, I think it's appropriate to the scale of the city. I hope anyway. But, uh, uh, but he was, very, he had, from my point of view, he was a much more sympathetic client than Dick Sellers. That's not for publication. And he, was, and he was so smart, so, uh, and very focused, so even though, you know, as a chairman, you don't get to see the chairman very often, but mm -hmm. when you saw him, he was very focused. Mm -hmm. Um, so this started with the circulation, and this was, I guess, the idea about the, the parking. Mm. The intercept parking. The intercept parking. Of course, this is the J&J &J parking, which is right. Mm -hmm. Has that happened? I don't think so. Is there parking Where there? is this? You, you really have small, smaller parking There's garages, parking over here. Yeah. Yeah. There's parking there. There's the Farron deck, which is right across from the train station, which would be over here. Um, well, obviously, we were advocating yeah, to get people. people. And there's Church Street Park. There's a deck on Church Street. So it's in further. Right, but it's not the, the, it's not the, the intercept park no. concept, which is just intercept and then, mm -hmm. then you know. So then, uh, that was mm -hmm. I think this might have been the first one, this might have been the second, because okay. here this was more mm -hmm. about tackling. Mm -hmm. In the second, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, and the two nodes, this was mixed use, so we did have that idea. Mm -hmm. I think this, that was, what was the idea? So that those are the ideas that are expressed mm -hmm. in here. Pretty 
clear mm -hmm. plan. And again, very much about you know, I'm struck how much contemporary planning things. This would be a very comfortable, uh, right. you know, less auto use, uh, mixed use, mm -hmm. um, neighborhood scale. Mm -hmm. So, and again, we were trying to avoid getting involved with the you know, prescription we were referring, we were referring to. Yeah. So that was, that's why this, and I think this must be the second phase because here it's more strategic, more of a, mm -hmm. and uh, what we did in the second phase. How good your files? Yeah. Is, uh, 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 see now it will all be electronic and then deleted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You would hope that one. Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, well, I think there's another document that might be relevant, but I don't have it with me here, that uh, discusses our concern. In fact, I think I'll try to find it here. Give me a minute. Because we were very much concerned about the fact that New Brunswick had had, had a series of sort of failed planning efforts, failed renewal efforts. And we didn't want to add to another, uh, to the pile of failed plans. So that's why we were emphasizing strategy, small steps that are realizable, and so on. I'd like to get that. Sure. We'll just make copies of this. It's a redevelopment. Right. And it was pretty much redeveloped, just get rid of the new, just get rid of the old, which reflected the thinking. In, in the, uh, at the time. There was a Rouse Commission in 1953 which said we need a mid-course correction to do less clearance, more renewal of the existing stock. Mm -hmm. We need to do it within a framework of, pl of planning to understand what makes a place tick, etc. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the 54 Housing Act, they changed the name of the program from urban redevelopment to urban renewal, because it was reflecting renewal rather than redevelopment. Now, of course, it didn't play out yeah, with, with um, as renewal. The other thing I wanted to share was, because you mentioned your firm's involvement with the uh, Society Hill urban renewal in uh, Philadelphia. Well, urban renewal was usually terrible for historic preservation. Mm -hmm. In a few places, the urban renewal plans yeah. in, in fact, embodied that, mm -hmm. and the Society Hill plan you know, yeah. being that. Uh, College Hill, you know, in, in Providence, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So awesome. I point this out to my classes. Yeah. Within the urban renewal, there, there were these More islands problems. of plans that were way ahead of, of, of what the, the contemporary mm -hmm. thinking was. Yeah, the right, right Society Hill did have substantial preservation, and we actually wove into Society Hill a series of townhouse squares mm -hmm. uh, designed to blend with the historic buildings. Uh, but uh, it's a. Uh, but I'm struck again how your plan was really a very. Today's, it's a very c contemporary, smart growth plan. Well, it's good. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, a couple of documents that might be of interest. Uh, this relates to Route 18, and I don't know whether that's interesting to you or not. But this is New Jersey School of Architecture. Faculty and students wrote to Ryan Pace and that Route 18 
was a disaster and shouldn't be allowed to happen. <laughs> we would like a copy of all the file, and whoever, whoever does it, <laughs> and whatever it costs, we'll, we'll just, it, it's important uh, to our record. Right? Uh, of course, Route 18 had a lingering controversy. Um, the bridge over, uh, the bridge wasn't built for many years. Yes, there was yet another controversy. According to my information, Johnson & Johnson, which practically owns New Brunswick and Middlesex County, is using economic blackmail to force this plan by threatening to move out of the bridges and build. Since J&J owns a large facility north, of, north on Route 18, a new Raritan bridge and eventual widening of the highway to their doorstep would make it easier for workers from New Brunswick to get to the plant. Of course, it would also help make citizens of the area and of this state helpless slaves of the automobile. Uh, it's, it's good to be young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. The, 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 there was, you know, there, there was similar reaction by um, yeah. by Rutgers link groups. Mm -hmm. So. so and this, I don't know whether this is of interest to you. Yep. This is evidently a thesis. A absolutely, for Hiram Market, yes. It's a, it's a MIT student thesis. Does that interest? Yeah, I would be. On, Hiram, on the Hiram Market development? Oh, really? Well, it's a student yeah. it's a thesis at MIT. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hiram Market was a very controversial, and in fact, in the end, they demolished you know, what was there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was viewed as it was right next to the hotel that was built, mm -hmm. and um, the you know the, that was one of the sort of black eyes, so to speak. I see. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that within within a larger context of could more of the existing stock have been uh, preserved? Um, I'm not sure if it's an urban legend. They said when, when Rockefeller was considering um, uh, what a potential site, that the ultimate winner being uh, Williamsburg, you know, looking for yeah. where was there a concentration of, uh, of, of an older housing stock. Um, supposedly, New Brunswick was not on the short list but was on the initial longer list. Oh, really? you know, of it, what would be 50 or 100 communities in, the, in which we would consider mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. Well, so I don't know why I can't find a particular document I was looking for. But uh, it was a memorandum in which we express concern about New Brunswick, and I'll try to find it, so, which we, we were expressing concern about uh, the city being given yet another plan followed by nothing happening. Right. Which was the sentiment you mentioned. Yeah. So did you, we heard from John Haldridge that he had taken Mr. Pay up in a helicopter to look over New Brunswick. Were you part of that survey of the downtown New Brunswick area? Further to that, with, with uh, Mr. Pavin saying this is where the, you know, we should have cultural facilities. This is, I see. Uh, on that, with, with much of that then happening, you know, have been realized. Uh, I see. Yeah. Do you, your wife's work is cited in here in the bibliography. Oh. <laughs> <Who's> work? <laughs> 
I his wife. It's an early publication. Okay. Right? His wife did a book on the architectural history of New Brunswick, 1681 to 1900. Okay. My wife was trained as an architectural historian, and she did her, her she did her dissertation on the architecture of New Brunswick. Oh, really? So that was that's interesting. Okay. Okay. We should have known that. So, I don't know, I mean, uh, I've sort of tried to give you a flavor of what we're mm -hmm. doing, and uh, I'm, uh, You've done that well, and, 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 and we, uh, I guess getting copies of all of this would be key to our research. If somehow, I know we don't do these things anymore, but that overlay would be a wonderful thing and then show what happened. So I don't know whether it's possible to make copies of the overlay, yeah. and, and whatever, we'll pay whatever it is. I, mean, I think this, yeah. is the, this is the key one. The key one, okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. for, but I don't quite know how. That we learn it ourselves. I guess it could be shot as slides even, starting at the, I mean, instead of, I don't know how else you would do that. Would you be interested in seeing, I believe this is sort of the plan, and now if we then show what, show happened. what happened, would that be of yeah. interest, interest to you? No, because what I'm talking about is literally been 30 years almost. Right. I mean, we did our work. 76, 77. Of course, we continued to work on the JJ headquarters wasn't finished until I think 83. Okay. But, uh, Who was the landscape architect you worked with? Laurie Olin. Oh, really? Laurie Olin? Uh, he did the landscape. For mm -hmm. and what kind of a presence it should have. <coughs> there was a debate. Some people who thought that we should build right on George Street and have ground floor retail and put Johnson Johnson upstairs. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, opted for, as I said, the building in the park, the park in the city. Uh, and part of that has to do with the, the you know, j, &J uh, because of their the business they're in is very concerned about security. Right. This is nothing to do with terrorism. It was, it was industrial has been Right. And so uh, they, they were, Jim Burke was very supportive of the park idea, but the reality is that the park couldn't just be flung open mm -hmm. people. And uh, so what we did is we picked up on the Rutgers campus in the public wall mm -hmm. uh, with the raised ground level behind it. It's an interesting thing that when you have a wall, if you raise the ground level behind it, it reads much less like a wall. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the walls, the ground on both sides is it's just a wall. But if, you, but if it's if it's a change of plane, it has a different reading. And somehow, I think it works that you, that you're, you're invited to enjoy the park even though you're not in it. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is a public access from 
one corner. Right. But I don't know whether how public it is. It's, it's really not. It, it, it's not. almost like the uh, privately owned public space in Manhattan yeah. in so many places. It's kind of. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's not really you know many of those areas are not really don't touch. publicly publicly enjoyed. So it's from that point of view problematic because it really doesn't do anything for George Street. Although arguably George Street is long enough in mm -hmm. here, if you can get it to come alive in there, that's about from a point of view of pedestrian. That's, mm -hmm. that's actually quite a good plan. But still, it's, uh, but, but it's, it's a problem. It, it, it yeah. I think it's also within the context of its time. I mean, when, when J, J was doing this, the, the move of corporate was out of cities. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I think, in, in part, what was done. You know, so we're in the city, we're a little, you know, we're, we're, we're not street, on the street itself, but there was some of that, and, but that was something that was not being done at that time. The, the main thing that I think J&J did was, was the whole word, I think. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I'm sorry that the hotel wasn't a better piece of architecture. You mean the Hyatt? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and actually, if I could ask, and I've been asking everyone, you know, with the, with the benefit, you know, with the benefit of, of hindsight, you know, things, knowing what we know now, things you know, might have been done differently, or, you know, looking back. I don't think that, I, I, first of all, um, coming back to my to, to the attitude that we brought to this uh, emergency plan, which was an attitude of trying to avoid over-prescribing and trying to make it very strategic. The aspect of that, the, the underlying that is a feeling that cities are living organisms and that uh, uh, you intervene in the life of a city at a certain moment uh, and you try to make that intervention positive, but you never but you don't try to prescribe everything that's going to come out from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that in those terms, what we tried to do made sense. And from what you're telling me, it seems to have been part of it. It's fulfilled. Mm -hmm over time. Uh, the key issue for me, which I haven't been there for so long, I'm really wondering what George Street is like. Is it a nice street? Is it a place that people want to go to? It's, it's nicer. I see. It's, it's, getting stronger. It it's getting stronger as, um, until the last maybe eight years, ten years, you had no national retailers. Yeah. It's because they just weren't signing leases. Yeah. That that has changed. Um, there is huge competition from the suburban malls. So again, that's a fact of life. Um, in, in part, it's maybe rethinking George Street as, and of course retail now is just a difficult environment. Mm -hmm. in, in, in part, you have restaurants becoming more the on-street, draw people in from the region, um, unique offering rather than another store doing X, Y, and Z, which is replicated mm -hmm. five times over now. You know, now Are there things like art galleries? Um, mm -hmm. not, no. No. 
there is an art gallery in our building that's part of the Mason Grove School of the Arts. And the Zimmerly Museum, of course, has expanded tremendously over the past few years. And that's almost, that's catty corner from the J&J. &J. It's on George Street past the railroad. I see. So those exist, but other galleries. And, and, and the city did, you know, as far as within what planners do to revitalize an area, and so there's a business improvement district, you know, that does yeah. promotion, okay. They widened the sidewalk. They, um, to allow some of the restaurants to, um, you know, to have on street uh, tables, uh, right. et cetera. Um, the, the street lighting was changed, you know, to have electric looking mm -hmm. gas lamps. Um, you know, there are planters. Um, it's not just um, plain vanilla um, concrete, you know, there, there's some texture uh, to that. Um, so, the, there was a time, if I recall correctly, well, I'm getting older, I, I just mm -hmm. lose, uh, I think there was, there was a pedestrian mall, wasn't, wasn't? Not that I, know, I, I Again, and maybe, maybe it was just a portion, and then of course that wasn't. Uh, right. Yeah. So, but it's a very yeah. narrow street, and there yeah. have been issues, um, there was a study done on a, putting in a light rail system that would have gone from Route 1 all the way out to Bound Brook that would have gone through the Rutgers campuses. But the issue was, what do you do with George Street because it's so narrow, and there's also now a bicycle path work going on, and George Street is too small. So they're looking at Nielsen Street, which is the next street down. But whenever you get, then then you get to J&J, &J, yeah, and you, you have to go it. around it, yeah. or you have to go under the railroad trestle. So that's been a bit of an issue. You know, George Street is still where most of the businesses and restaurants are, although there are some off on other streets. Um, but because it's so narrow, it has transportation issues yeah. in it. There's no longer any parking allowed on it, fortunately. Because when there was parking allowed, it, there was hardly any way to get through there. And it's two ways. Yes, two it's ways. two ways. Yeah, right. And some of the old bank buildings have become other things. You know, they, those still exist. Well, it have to be reused. Right. Um, and and, and there's some chains that came in, like Starbucks, and there's a Chipotle going into an old, an old pharmacy building. Those kinds of things. But it's still, you know, there's a dollar store. The Woolworth became a dollar store or something like that. So there's some not not so desirable things. And things take a long time, right. like in terms of redevelopment. You know, really, it just takes decades. I mean, it took it took three decades of non-residential before the uh, housing market right. you know, to, uh, opened up. Right. I mean that. Um, but this area is healthy now. Yeah, it this, seems to be. Th th this area is. Um, it, it is. It is stronger. And in fact, you were getting on the urban renewal lands, um, uh, you know, housing being built. Uh, interestingly, often suburban developers who were thwarted by NIMBYism, you know, it was just hard to get anything approved anymore. They could come to New Brunswick and then with a cooperative city government and in place, you know, a DEFCO that could do various things. And they could be approved for, you know, thousands of units and three months, et cetera. So the, the developers rethought New Brunswick as, as, as a market. Uh, so that, um, in part, there were outside forces that weren't per se uh, on New Brunswick. At the very end of the Hiram District, there is a street that retained the old original buildings. And there's a wonderful I don't know if it's a five-star restaurant. The Frog and the Peach restaurant mm -hmm. was put in down there. Uh, which is which end? Way down near the, closer to the water. Oh, down, down here, behind the Hyatt Hotel. Um, and there's and also a, there are two restaurants there. They're in, very good. And there's the, a lot of nightlife. In existing down there. older, interesting structures. Right. Mm -hmm. Brick. And, and at, at the time, the city was fighting. They wanted to get rid of these because right. they wanted to clear it. Yeah. Again, this is 2020 hindsight. And then 
they were very tenacious and were able to stay. Right. And in fact, those are the new anchors. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. culture. You know, what, what does a city like New Brunswick offer to a region? You know, it's really, retail's hard. Mm -hmm. Retail's hard. And then it's going to take a lot more residential to provide the on-site mar market to, uh, to do that. But the culture became a regional draw, and then the restaurants linked to that. Mm -hmm. um, and the university must still be a regional. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it has grown. I mean, there are more students now than before. Do the students use downtown? More now than they did because there are buildings downtown. Yes. And it's so there's kind of actually kind of now. Back and forth. Yeah. Right. And so Rutgers has a presence down. Yes. Here. Yes. Right. That's actually it, useful. Right. Even though it took a while, you know, for a right. while the Rutgers was sort of just staying where it was. Yeah. And where they did some construction, I guess in the, um, the 60s, it was on none, they were going away from the Brunswick. Mm -hmm. Your institute is here, but you, right. don't, you don't do teaching here. Yes. You do in that building. Graduates. Graduate classes. Right. Right. And we share a building with um, the Mason Gross School, which is our, um, you know, with the training artists, etc. So, what you have there are interesting looking students, you know, with purple hair, but they're there at all hours. So, right. it kind of gives a, you know, an arty, um, urban flavor in, in a good way. In a good way. And the residence hall is a block away. But, but that's recent. Right. Only two or three years. It was in the last. And what about the leadership in New Brunswick? Does New Brunswick tomorrow still exist? Yes. Yes. It does. And so does Devco, the, the development corporation. And, and both exist. Both have been viewed, at least by some, as a model. You know, but also reflecting, you need both the social and the development. You know, sort of the development tomorrow in DEFCO. Um, DEFCO has become very successful development and they've become more, more and more sophisticated, uh, being it's able a to... Public it's a public benefit corporation. It's a... DEFCO is a public benefit corporation. It's... it's quasi-public? Quasi qu quasi you know, it's... Yes. Yes. I mean... Uh, it's separate the, from New Brunswick tomorrow. Yes. 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 It does the physical yeah. building. Planning and building part, and and NBT they bring developers in this park. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And exactly. and you know, getting as much public money as possible to you know match with whatever projects are doing. NBT is social services. Right. NBT started, I think, as sort of both, and then Devco broke out and became the developer. And then over time, they became, as they started to do bigger and bigger projects, they became more and more sophisticated. They, right. they can work with the city in terms of using eminent domain powers, which of course has its own controversies now, but nonetheless, if you're doing this type of development, you know, you, 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 you often need that. Um, so that's... Uh, How is the downtown surviving the current recession? I think a few restaurants come and go, you know, a few businesses come and go, but most of the storefronts have something in them. Yeah. You know, so New Brunswick's also attracted a large Mexican population. Mm -hmm. So there's even now one or two Mexican restaurants on George Street. There's an Ethiopian restaurant, there's a Thai restaurant, really? there's a Vietnamese restaurant. <laughs> so it's quite diverse. So, so, so that's where, again, right. the restaurants have somewhat supplemented retail is the type of activity along the right. spine. The, the other thing that has happened is the hospitals became huge, right. both in terms of scale and activity, which has happened in many other urban areas. The, the local hospital, which was Middlesex General, was adopted by the Robert Wood uh, Foundation. Now, now it's the Robert Wood, Robert Wood Hospital, etc. So right. that, that has just grown geometrically, um, which provides employment, etc. Not often not well designed buildings. You know, they design, um, they they become islands unto themselves. It's almost like the old uh, Atlanta or Renewal where there was no street mm -hmm. presence and uh, et cetera. But, but nonetheless, 
it has been important. Uh, we will share with you, because again, what I want to do is almost use some of your, your, initial, your, your initial concepts slides with, with things today. You know, what, what's what happened happen today? To share, share with you. Yeah. Well, I'll try to get, I'm not quite sure how I'll do this, but I'll try to get you uh, some of the other things that have been done. Well, is it important to have a sequence or just the totality? Um, the sequence is whatever, whatever, whatever works. works for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we that. can only do the totality, that's okay. But if we could get the sequence. Yeah. I mean, even if it was done separately and then with the totality, it's whatever works. Mm -hmm. whatever works. Uh, well, whatever and yeah, and we can keep in touch with Anne, I guess, and if she could let us know what, I mean, we're happy to pay you for the full cost we, we, of the copies. We, 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 <coughs> full cost we, of the copies. This is an important file in terms of what happened. So if we could just Everything's have it copied and... And we can come and pick it up? Pick it up, you know, we can, we can make whatever, whatever works yeah. best for you. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. You're not in a big rush. No, no. no so probably won't be whatever, done. whatever works for you. Yeah, um, no big rush. Okay. Um, We've been at this since last June doing interviews, and it could go on yet another year yes. before we. It's also a chain of interviews, you know. We yeah. Uh, Your, your notes were very, were very helpful. Right. Yeah, well that, because it gives a flavor of how we actually would present it. Sure. Right. I'll copy those. Okay. And, uh, and you've been very generous with your time. And, uh, I really appreciate it. Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's not easy to it's, it's, deal with this. Again, your focus is from 60s to 70s. Well, and and, with, and know, subsequent and, and subsequent and and, yeah. and um, you know and also to this, I think to you make should go back to this guy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. 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 Yes. I, 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 because this is really. I mean, I, I I haven't read it for a long time. All I remember is it's actually very well written. Which it I looks appreciate. like it. Yes. I. I, I mean, the guy was really. I've seen the 1950s sort of you know, standard urban renewal plans, you know, yeah. which were not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, we were looking at a table of population growth. Oh, yeah. it was, uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure that the students and say, you have to be humble when you do these things. Yes, <laughs> it's, just showing, you know, it's actually at now 45,000. Oh, it is? Yeah. yeah. Really? Right. 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 I see. So that's where it was. And, and that's more where, or less where it was. Well, basically, it was. you then had the depression, so yeah. things weren't growing right. that much. Um, the war period, of course, and then I guess in the early 50s, you know, was the last um, sort of stronger period, and then it was the, the classic uh, change. I mean, the thing I like about it is the sort of tone of voice, like cross of traffic control. Because so many people writing, you know, planning is so often bureaucraties. And this mm -hmm. guy says, "Did you ever stop to think how much street congestion costs in Brunswick?" I mean, it's a <laughs> conversational right. tone. Right. That's, right. That's a Only a few years ago, there was no such thing as a traffic cop. <laughs> Today, the patrolmen engaged in regulating traffic constitute a large part of the police force in many cities, and so on. It pulls in. Right. Yeah. It pulls in. It's, uh, and his company was in Clifton. Oh, no, this sorry. is, that, this is that Herbert Swan. Swan. I don't know where, but Herbert the other Swan one was Clifton. is a guy. He was in New York. Oh, New York. He's a person, if I were in the academic world, I, would, I think he's a person worth doing something on. I don't yeah. know whether anybody's 
Why don't you get one of your students to do it? Yeah, sure. I'm sure. Because I th just yeah. reading this, it, it's very compelling. Mm -hmm. it, it's very well written and very thorough, and kind of modest in a way, but mm -hmm. practical. You know, it says there's something about it. Well, you can learn a lot just going through the, the many plans that were made in the process. Yeah. You know who might have had it was Don Kirkeberg. Maybe that's where I remember it because Don You should try to get there. But you want me to copy this? Please. Yes, Please. because I don't, you know, we may find it, but it's, since you have it. Well, for places you would to. think would have it, just because they don't have their rack entirely. Right. Coat tour with um, I guess Jack Byer from Byer Going to Bow. Oh, yes. We were uh, we teaching a Stark preservation class actually oh, yeah. in the uh, this was in the Harvard School of Design. So I, I've been right. teaching that, and then I said, because almost almost all the students were architects, because oh. that's that, that's the school of design. Yeah. And then uh, when was that? Oh, must be about that's a while back. I was ten, ten years ago, maybe? I mean, I mean that, uh, oh, that's so. I, I chaired the Department of Architecture there for five years in the 80s. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that, uh, but just later. Right. And then I remember I had to make a class more interesting because I had always taught planners. Mm -hmm. And then how, how I can make it more interesting to architects. And then, as it turns out, I would have a bunch of uh, landscape architects mm -hmm. who were drawn in there. It made me think about uh, you know, how to classic historic preservation, landmarking, what you allowed and not to allow. How does that play out in terms of the landscape uh, mm -hmm. uh, setting? And in fact, the, you know, the classic preservation tools haven't really been thought about very well with, 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 with landscape as opposed to structures. One of the interesting phenomena of recent years is the resurgence of landscape, yes. the redefinition, the expansion of landscape mm -hmm. as a profession. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Laurie Allen, who, who, he's done a lot of work with us. I discovered him uh, when he was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he came back, we were his first clients actually. Now he's one of the major landscape right. firms in right. the country. That's true. And uh, this was his first major project. Huh. Well, you, had a, you had a nose for That's good time. Yeah. yeah. Now you've also done some buildings in Princeton. Yes. Correct? We just okay. finished. I live, I live in Princeton. My husband's an assistant vice president there. And I used we used to live on William Street, right across from the Friend Center. Oh yes, well that was our. We have three projects in Princeton. Mm -hmm. That was done in the seventies, the Spelman Hall. Oh yeah. The second one that was I and Pay did that. The second one was my project for Friends Center. Okay. And the third one just finished is my project for Butler College. Yeah. Okay, that's right. So, you, do, do you recall somebody named Donna Ching, who did? She's a designer. Yes. And she did a lot of work on, you know, I guess the opening or yes, what yes. it right because we also work with Donna. Uh, yes, because I had a big celebration. Right. Right. At the end of September. Right. That was a major project. Right. It took five years or so. Wow, that's great. Well, we'll see if you can, we can get you to New Brunswick sometime to see what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after we do the After we do get after, out the in, information. Yeah. I think from what are you going to do with all this? I mean, what's your aim Well, we got, we got some initial funding just to get the, I guess you'd say, oral history part dealing, talking with 
the original leaders of the project and others who have been very involved in the redevelopment. Um, we were hoping to get more funding, whether we would do a publication, whether we'd end up with you know, materials for class use, or whether we'd have some kind of an exhibit at some point for a visitor center, whatever, on the project. We're not quite sure, it all depends on what we, what we end up with in the way of materials, and then how we format it's, that. It, it's, it's some wonderful materials, I and mean, then it plays out against how cities redo themselves. We're at least making it available on a website okay. for other people doing planning related projects in the Rutgers archives once we, you know, documents like this we would put into the Rutgers archives. Planning initiatives tend to be ephemeral. Right. In terms of documentation. Right. <laughs> and, I mean, sometimes you have big reports. Uh, urban renewal had projects had huge documentation. But, uh, So easy to keep track of everything. Right. I mean, I'm, just, I'm, I'm quite impressed. Right. And I was um, a neighbor. I lived very close to John Heldrich and nice. very good friends of his, Ralph Voorhees, in Highland Park. Uh -huh. And they would talk about these, you know, what had happened. Yeah. But it wasn't written down. So I finally said, you know, we need to get these stories. It was all anecdotal. Well, it wasn't all anecdotal, but a lot of it was anecdotal about yeah. what the decision making was. So we began really by wanting to know more about, you know, what decision making took place, what kind of leadership did it take well, to make this happen. Is probably, I mean, you're lucky to have Helmut. Yes. Yes. He's yes. The most yeah, yes. He's, yes. Uh, he lived with him. He was that was his main assignment yes. for where Johnson Johnson. Right. And, and right. We haven't fully accessed all his files, but he has voluminous files. Right. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. A good recall of many things, so, so there, there's still a lot for us to do. Right. <laughs> Another interesting aspect was the just the personal. People may have left New Brunswick, but they went across the river to Highland Park. Yeah. Like John Holmes. So there was a tie back. People would belong to New Brunswick churches, so even if they now moved a half hour away. You know, things you don't think about, the, the interconnections that influence why something, you know, mm -hmm. you know happens. So the scale of the city. It's easier to work within a city of 40,000 than you know, St. Louis that had been at what, 800,000, now yeah. 400,000, you know, it's, it's just the, the same activity in a larger city would have less of an impact. I mean, here it's... Uh, well, it would be, I mean, New Brunswick is small enough, especially in downtown, mm -hmm. it would be actually very interesting to have a historic atlas mm. of downtown New Brunswick showing the state of play. Mm -hmm starting whenever, possibly back we're, in we're, we're hoping the 19th century to do that, and you know, but periodically you see right. what, what, what was. Well, that's what John Heldridge, pattern, what was. John yeah. Heldridge said he wished we could have some kind of a, you know, a visitor center or an exhibit place somewhere where you could do that, show the history of the development from the beginning, and also some kind of a history of the you know, demographic patterns, because there have been so many different, you know, the Hungarians who came through, and now it's a large Mexican population, but some tie between those two about what's happened over time physically to New Brunswick. Is there a history of New Brunswick? Up until the, the, a certain point, you know, I guess. Little bits and pieces, you know, that they are various annuals, you know, there would be something, you know, brought together. But there's enough we can draw, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know, we're looking for the visual, you know, like the, you know, yeah. the, 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 the aerial photo, <laughs> if it existed, you know, from yes. 1940, you yeah. know, it's yes. just, you know, Right. That's good to have. Yeah. Right. So we're going to keep at it. We just wanted to start with the interviews with people because, you know, we wanted to 
get the memories and, and understand better the whole environment at the time. What you have to work with. Yeah. And, and there will be another product. I mean, I said, uh, right. It's more than just to just archive them. And I hope to maybe down the road almost teach a class on New Brunswick. Let's sort of learn about planning. Well, as a, mm -hmm. as as a characteristic of the Yes, right. right. You know, the fact that, again, coming back to the response, the fact that New Brunswick commissioned this thing in the 1920s. In the 1920s, you was quite really, you, for a city its size, you know, you really weren't getting. And it's a comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, it deals with everything. I wonder what happened, what the, whoever was that asked for this, whether it was the then mayor or whatever, if they did any well, remember, this changes. Is, this is 25, and, the, and then the Depression hit, so, right. so you were figuring how to survive, and then the war hit, right. and then it was 1950. Right. And that, and they only had a little, a, you know, a little few years, right. and, then, and then you had big forces going on. Right. Yeah. It was probably everybody forgot about it. Could be. <laughs> but, the As 20s, but, but the idea that this kind of planning was happening. That's yeah. right. I, I, I should Google this guy and see if there's anything on him. Because I, I, I'm, very, uh, I'm very impressed with this. Stuff. I'm going to follow up on that. Small plans anyway. Yeah. You've got to make yeah. smaller strategic plans. Yes. That, that's what. <laughs> that's I'm, right. Yes. That's what I'm Wasn't that about the time the American Planning Association started in the 1920s? So there was a city planning commission. Yeah, okay. Which was ahead of its time. Right. Okay. Well, I will. Uh, thank you very much. I'll take two. Yeah, you've, been, you've been most generous with your time yes. and uh, your insights. Interesting. Topic. It's been out of my head for quite a few years. No, <laughs> it's no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, it was a So whatever you can find I'll out. Put then. something together. Allow us to reciprocate in any way. Okay. Right. Anything okay. you can, uh, if you're in New Jersey and you need stuff on X, Y, and Z, <laughs> be happy. Please, uh, please let us. Uh, okay. in, in a typical ivory tower way.